So we're going to do a panel on giving back to the community, and it is my privilege to moderate this panel. I joined Day of Security in 2021 when they wanted to take it from an in-person conference to a virtual conference. So Matt here, I had met him when we worked at Open Door together. I was L&D for engineering, and he was on the security team, and he said, you've been a risk manager for a long time. You think like us. Come basically be our friend. And I loved that. So when they had this opening, Matt said, hey, you should come. You're, you're pretty technical. You should come like do this thing. And I know you can do it. I know it'll be great. And also, I think it's a great cause to get involved with, with Day of Security. So that's how I ended up here. And um, two and a half years later, I'm still here. And um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, sorry, it's been a busy week. I'm a little tired at this point. <laughs> But anyways, um, the folks sitting next to me are have been in, engaged with us for a long time, um, longer than I have, and they are our co-founders, their advisory board. So we have a little bit about DOS. We have a core team, which is myself, Jan, who you just heard from, Adrian Brantley that you heard from this morning. And the four of us are kind of like the board that says, hey, this is when the date's going to be, and here's where we want to have locations. Their advisory board are my security professional colleagues who say, yeah, these talk tracks look good. Like, Let's pick these talks um, after they go through the review process. They help me pick out the schedule and keep me in tune with hot topics, current trends, and just you know, if I say something that's not the right thing, they'll call me out on that too. <laughs> um, so anyways, I want to give them the chance to introduce themselves. I have a few questions and then we'll open it up for Q&A for you all. So um, Tad, do you want to start down at the end from me and then we'll work our way back? Sure. Tad Whitaker, I live in San Francisco. I am the head of security at Apollo GraphQL. And before that, I was the head of security at Circle CI. And I am a co-founder of Day Security with Matt. And I'm also a mid-career sh uh, shifter. So I was not born with experience. I um, was a newspaper reporter, a private investigator for almost 10 years. And then I was a somewhat self-taught coder using YouTube tutorials and went to a boot camp and eventually made my way into a support engineering job, just the most basic customer service thing using code possible and kind of made my way up there at 39. So. Hey everyone, Swati Joshi. I'm the VP of SaaS Cloud Security at Oracle. Previous to this, I was at Netflix. I led their detection and response team. And before that, I was at Mandiant doing advanced persistent threat type stuff. Um, yeah, I, I live in South Bay um, and I've been involved with Day of Security for a couple of years. Thanks to Tad who introduced me to Day of Security. So thank you. And I've been on the advisory board. It's been you know, this is a passion of mine. I'm, uh, I'm interested in sort of solving that early career problem. And then also sort of, you know, late to senior exec management. Why do we have like such a drop um, in the number of women? Um, so yeah, both of those are a uh, passion of mine. Excited to be here. Um, I am Lisa Hall. I am most recently CISO at Color Health, and prior to that, I uh, had a security at pager duty for about three years ish. And I've been on the advisory board for a while, a couple of years. It's a little blur. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but yeah, really excited that you all are here and we're in person again. And um, yeah, yay. <laughs> you have one. I, I have my own mic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take Matt seriously. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Matt Torben, uh, along with Tad. Uh, I am a co-founder of Day of Security. Uh, I'm also a staff engineer, staff security engineer at a company called Blue Elm. Uh, and so DEIB is something I've been doing since 20, 2012, um, back in Philly, so I can you know, talk about that as well. But uh, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, so I'm excited because we're bringing together senior leaders and practitioners in cybersecurity who've been actively involved in giving back to the community. And that's really what we want to talk about is I know, uh, you know, we talk a lot about like 
how to get started your career, how to grow your career. But there's also this huge element of how do we give back? And I think Jan talked about that too. So I wanted to hear from folks who are doing it is what's to start off, what's an area of interest to you when giving back? Like, what is it that you hope to contribute to or make change with when you're giving back? And we can do popcorn style. I have others that are designated specific to folks. All the eyes shifted left. So I guess we'll <laughs> start down here. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is around breaking down the risk of mentoring people and helping people get that first job. That's uh, one of the hardest things I think out there. And a lot of times it can feel like some insurmountable thing to try and help someone get their first job. And it kind of can be a lot of work, but I also think there's a lot of education that needs to happen for those of us who are inside the golden walls. You know, if you actually do have a job in security and you get paid for it and you are somebody in a privileged position like that, your weight really does carry a lot of water with recruiters inside your company. Your, your job title carries a lot of weight when you reach out and poke somebody on LinkedIn and say, hey, um, this woman right here has shown a real interest in security. And because you work at Cloudflare, there's this job opening. If you wouldn't mind uh, just passing them on to the recruiter for that job, honestly, that's slipping them in through the side door so they're not having to go to cloudflare.com, uh, go to the, the jobs page and be one of 9,000 people that send their resume in. You know, if, if you actually work in the company, that all, almost automatically gets them an interview. And it's little things like that, that that help make the experience easier for underrepresented groups and whatnot. So that's definitely the big thing that I'm the most focused on. I've been involved with three different um, sort of organization, all in the same area of education and especially for women and girls. Um, I'm on the board for an organization called Sahasra Deepika, which means Thousand Lights. It's a school in India that has 60 kids and we provide schooling and um, they stay there, um, you know, throughout through the college years. Um, so that's one. The other one is, of course, Day of Security, where to, you know, Tat's point, um, really need to focus on sort of that early, early career. Can we get folks into the door? How can we do that? And also sort of mid-career. Then I sit on the board for an organization called Forte Group. Forte is a group of women, uh, VPs and CISOs, um, senior executive women. And we see a huge drop, right? Like when women go from mid-career to senior career, there is about 28% drop and why that is. So that's another passion of mine. So if I if I look at, you know, three of these organizations that I'm involved with and across, you know, education and um, can help girls get in in all areas, right? Like senior exec management and also early mid-career. So that's been my passion. One quote that I can really relate to is from Malala Yousafzai of Educate a Girl, Change the World. I love that. Um, yeah, I think to coattail off the getting people involved early, I think that's a big part of mentorship and just volunteering. Things like data security, um, volunteer not as much anymore as, as I used to, but Black Girls Code, um, just getting people excited about computers and security early on. Um, and then partially what I enjoy about being like in the CISO role or hiring manager role is I get to build the team. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, not just me, but I can influence what my team looks like. Um, Actually, there was a panel at one of the other day of securities where I built a security team. We were 18 and we were majority women. And everyone's like, there's a pipeline problem. <laughs> so I love being able to actually influence, um, you know, having the role I have. And also, as Tad was saying, making connections with folks. Um, you know, there's been a lot of like downsizing and being able to help people who are looking and they reach out. And, you know, if I've spoken with them and believe in them, being able to make introductions. And it just feels really good because you're giving back. And that's the position. Position we're in, we might as well use it. 
Do you have one? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use this one. For um, I, I, I think to just kind of dovetail along what, what Tad is saying, um, I mean, when I started, when we started Dave Security, there's really was two problems. There was the, the hiring problem where companies don't know what they want and they're asking for all sorts of things. And then there's people who want to get in and get that experience and don't get that opportunity. I mean, a lot of what I would see is, you know, you would have a candidate come in who can code in six different languages and can build all of this infrastructure. But like, oh, but you don't know how to point and click in Burp Suite. Sorry. You know, and it's kind of like that's the, the thing. And it just it was very frustrating to see that that not be the thing that, that keeps people from getting that opportunity. And so providing that education so we can get those folks in and employed is, is what drives me. So. Thank you. Um, I want to, if you want to watch Lisa's talk when she was at Pager Duty, it's still on YouTube uh, under the March 2021 talks. It was really interesting. If, uh, let's see. So for the, for anyone who wants to answer this, if you're trying to transition into the industry, how do you recommend getting involved? Because I think we see a lot that there's a lot of people who want to get involved, who want to get involved. They want to enter the industry. Maybe they're a new grad, maybe they're a career changer, but that barrier to entry is really high and it's a very difficult wall to, to scale and get over. So um, we know involvement can be a great way to overcome that. What do you recommend? So, okay, this is an opportunity for me to talk about how much I love Swati's talk this morning. <laughs> there was a big checklist, and that checklist was absolutely everything I would recommend. If I was going to highlight one item on that list, it would be volunteering at conferences. Uh, I have volunteered at um, Packet Hacking Village in DEF CON. Highly recommend the Packing Hacking, at Packet Hacking Village. Huge, huge fan of that, of that village. Um, at B-Sides SF, again, I also highly recommend B-Sides SF. Um, many of the same people are at uh, B-Sides Las Vegas, so I, I haven't been there, but uh, I would speak well of them as well. And of course, Dave Security. But, you know, the, the key to this is that when you're, it seems kind of bass backwards when you think about this, you're like, I'm going to a conference. Why would I volunteer my time? Because you are literally shoulder to shoulder with hiring managers. And when the converse, conversation comes up where they're like, hmm, what are you doing? They already see your work ethic because you're there lugging boxes or helping to set up computers or do other things. They already see what you are as a person. And that kind of nut already of like, what kind of employee are you going to be is kind of already solved. So huge, huge fan of those opportunities. So uh, to illustrate that, um, with two good points. Number one, when I came in today and sat down, there was a woman sitting one kind of chair over from me and introduced myself. And then another woman came and sat down and she introduced herself and she's the head She's the head of like about rubbing shoulders. She's the head of the master's degree program at UC Berkeley. And I was like, holy crap, that's amazing. I would never get into that program, but there's the head of it. And I'm sitting here talking to them. And then she said, have you met the CISO for UC Berkeley? And that was the other one. I was like, oh my God, wow, that is so impressive. Just going and talking at conferences and volunteering and that kind of thing. I mean, like those are the first two people that I sat down here next to. But then the second anecdote, when Matt and I met, um, we both didn't work in security and we both had heard about this thing called monthly OWASP meetups. And Matt was a JavaScript developer at a security company that would not let him take a security job. Like, honestly, think about that. They, he said, I'm interested in that. They wouldn't let him even apply for a, a security job because he was just a JavaScript developer. And so he sits down next to me and I'm feeling super weird because the CISO of Twitter is leading the meetup and I can't even believe we're in the same room as that guy. <laughs> and, and that's really where Matt and I started. Like neither one of us worked in security, but it started at that OWASP meetup. And we eventually, like within what, three meetings, we were volunteering to lead the thing, honestly. And, you know, now look at us, but a lot of that, like all of this came out of going and picking up pizza boxes and finding a venue for OWASP meetups and that kind of thing. Go ahead. I also think 
that you know volunteering opportunities are great also you all are in a position to say what can i give back to the community too right like not only what can the community provide for me mm-hmm. so i think that that will be kind of another way of looking at it and these opportunities and the people you want to meet like those those doors will open um you know once you really ask yourself what can i do for this community and the more you kind of get involved with i think the answer will be clearer mm-hmm. thanks i l- oh. I, i actually have one other little anecdotal story which uh, will kind of illustrate this and when i was working at the the info booth at the packet hacking village um i had somebody come over and ask about my homegrown uh wifi analyzer that i built in a raspberry pi and we got into this conversation uh with a small group of people uh about you know insecure wifi especially at coffee houses swear to god that the 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 audience kind of clears except for this one gentleman who comes up to me and he says are you interested in working in seattle i'm not mentioning names but he goes are you interested in working in seattle and i was like no no thank you and he hands me his card it was the hiring manager for a place in seattle that makes coffee um who had heard me talk about this entire story with him sitting right there but these things happen so don't discount these opportunities I mean I think that's a really good point if you never know who you're going to sit in the room with. Um I got to know when I worked at Berkeley, I got to know the vice chancellor for student affairs because of conference involvement. Um and I was a coordinator, so there was like about 10 people, 10 levels between the two of us. Um so Tad and Matt, you both have talked to I know all of you do mentorship, um but I've talked to Tad and Matt a lot about mentorship. So you're both really involved in that. If you look if there's a mentor and mentorship channel on Slack and I know Tad's been extra passionate about really getting that up and running um so how I want to start with Tad with this one and then go to Matt but um Tad how do you recommend people show up as mentors as a mentor you you have a certain amount of privilege that you bring to the relationship and there's a power dynamic and a pow- and a power imbalance there and so i really think you need to show up like it's a job and you need to treat it professionally and i also think you it's your job to break down any type of barrier that exists and probably the best example that i have is if you want to help somebody you need to take it on yourself to schedule that meeting and to schedule the follow up one because every single person i've ever mentored at one point or another has said oh i didn't want to bother you because you seem important and i'm always like no seriously like like i I've, i've told you i and then i feel bad for saying it that way and so i just started taking on and saying like in the last couple of minutes that i would meet with them let's set up time right now so that they just don't ever have to feel awkward about asking for my time that kind of thing thank you and then because i think i asked that question because a lot of times we expect the it seems like the mentee always has to show up and follow up and be the one doing everything but a good mentor shows up for you too yeah exactly i think you really do have to show up for the for that person because they in they always feel like they're a burden mhm yeah and i would i would add to like if if you don't have time or capacity to mentor just be honest <laughs> Yeah, I can hear everybody echoing. I know virtually yes. I'll repeat everybody's going yes. <laughs> um, we all have busy schedules and so that's really important. And then Matt, I'd love to know what you recommend for a mentee to be actively involved in their development because it's not one-sided either way. It's a dual relationship that goes both ways. Um before I reference Swati's really awesome presentation one more time, um she did not pay me for this. Um it, No, I mean again, I mean the things that were listed this morning is is exactly it. I mean there's you know, we as mentors um we we'll give you stuff to work on and stuff that we ask of you, I can't do it for you. Um and the most successful mentees that I've had are the ones who take the things that we ask and like take it to the next level. And and you know, if I if I say please go through my LinkedIn and like tell me where you want to work with the people who are hiring, please go through my LinkedIn and I will repeat it one more time. please go through my linkedin and find the places you want to work and i'll be glad to make the in, in uh the introductions but i can't guess 
Like, you know, I'm almost 50. I can't remember sometimes where I leave my skateboard. I mean, I'm seriously like, like, you got to help me out. Like, if you tell me like, this is who I want you to introduce me to. Great. Totally do it. But I do need you to step up and like, help me. Thank you. And I can confirm that Matt will do that. He actually sat on the phone with me back when I was searching and was like, hey, okay, let's go through. Where do you want to apply? <laughs> Lisa and Swati, you're both women in cybersecurity leadership roles. Did your engagement with the community help you attain your current roles? And how was your professional journey impacted by that involvement? Oh, yes. Sorry, I was taking a second. <laughs> This is this is a difficult one because I don't I didn't come into the community thinking that it's gonna help me go places or it's gonna take me places or or any of that. I I I really wanted to connect with everyone. I do deeply believe in the mission. So when kind of Tad introduced me to it, I was like, yes, of course, I'm going to do this. But I do think along the way, like it's helped me so much, right? Like by talking to all of you, like I really understand what's going on in the ground floor, especially with my current role now. Sometimes you are a level or two detached from the actual work. And that's how it's supposed to be if you're doing your job well, like you do want to put your push decisions down so i think chatting with all of you and really understanding you know how how difficult it is to get into the market like why is the bar so high right like why are we not able to solve these things that's been of tremendous value to me being on the advisory board i wouldn't have worked with you know lisa with tad with brianne and a, and a bunch of other people so that gives me a real sense of you know teamwork and and how do we kind of push this mission forward. Um, a lot of times when I review uh, the CFPs, you know, we often have these discussions of, okay, why are we seeing these many talks in this area? Or why aren't we seeing as many talks in this other area? Is it because a lot of women are kind of not coming in for this? Is this, you know, people are, people are burnt out, overworked, they don't have the time to submit? You know, kind of those kind of insights, I think, really help me be a better leader. And that's the, the biggest thing that I've, I've learned from this community. Nice. Um, I have had, I, I love the security community, not that we, we have our faults for sure. Um, but I think it's, it's such a community community. <laughs> it really is. Um, people are amazingly graceful with each other and helping each other. Um, when I, I'm from the Bay Area originally, but I was in Dallas uh, for a few years, and this was around when I was getting into security, um, like 2007 or something. And um, Twitter was like where I found my community, um, and still connected to tons of people from from then. Much smaller uh, group back then, um, but that was kind of you know virtually where I was able to connect. Um, and so, yeah, I think it really is great to be able to have um, resources, whatever works for you, like virtually, in person. Um, and finding mentors, going back to that, was, was huge for me as well. Um, and not just in security. A lot of your companies um, probably have like mentorship programs just from leaders. Um, also super helpful. Um, and I guess my other point on mentorship is they're kind of like a therapist. So if it's not working for you, switch them. <laughs> Thank you. So all of you have been really actively involved, maybe sometimes over-involved and had to make tough decisions. Um, how do you make the choice of where to get involved, how to spend your time, what's going to be best for you as a person and as a professional? Um, so uh, speaking personally, I, I get very frustrated when I see somebody who has the capability, has the talent, has the, the skills to, to get it to the next level. And there's like that one thing that's keeping them from, from just like going from average to great. And so like, that is my drive is when I see somebody who's like, like, damn it, you just need that one little push, you know, whether it's like a, a class or a talk, or sometimes it's, it's a hard conversation, but you have to do that to get that person to where you really can see them just blow up. And uh, yeah, that's, that's where I, I find my, um, my inspiration. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think most of my inspiration is like coming from seeing people succeed around me and like being like, oh, I helped in that. And it just feels really good. And being able to help people and be in a position to where I can um, is probably. I just remember my own experience. It was so brutally hard to break in. And even though I'm a straight white guy, it was so brutally hard hard to break in. Um, I didn't have a technical degree or anything like that. And it took forever and it just didn't seem like it needed to take that long. And so I, I always I tend to sit there and think, I honestly owe it back to the world to make that easier for at least some cohort of people. I wasn't going to tell a Tad story, but I don't know if you remember this. Um, early in our career, um, I was complaining to Tad about how many companies I had to go through before I got my first job. And Tad's response was a PDF. It was about six pages long of, of all of the, like, so I, I quit complaining at that point. But, but like, um, yeah, it's, it, he, he has earned his way in. I think after the boot camp I did, I'm pretty sure I, I got 453 rejections before I got the lowest level support engineer job with no benefits as a contractor at Circle CI. And then, but then within six months, I was a full time security engineer there. So, but I'm pretty sure it was 453 rejections. Oh man, my six rejections seem like shit. Like, it's. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's so bad. Why was that on the slide? <laughs> I only had 112. I think that's great just to put into perspective, right? Like people that maybe we all look up to and seeing that, you no, know, it takes a while for everyone. And sometimes it's timing. Sometimes it's, it's all kinds of, you know, influences, but persevere. Yeah, I think that's a great point. We can't, can't judge a book by its cover. You can't look at someone to see where they've gotten to and, and not, you know, perhaps not know that they actually face some challenges and struggles to get there. Um, the other, uh, so what it sounds like when you're trying to prioritize, like how you spend your time, it sounds like you really choose where you get your inspiration from and what's going to like give you the most joy and satisfaction of spending your time in that area. and know that you can have a big impact. Awesome. So <laughs> what? We all said yes. 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 You are correct. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, we have some time and I wanted to leave time at the end for folks to ask questions because I'm sure you have great ones that did not come out of my brain. And I'm going to bring the mic if you're in person. I'm going to bring the mic to you just so people virtually can hear you and we don't have to repeat it then. Um, and if it's someone virtually, then we'll just read it into the mic so everyone in the room can hear it. Okay, I'm going to go. I saw the back first and then I'll come back. <laughs> Hi, uh, does anybody on the panel have a volunteer opportunity coming up soon? If so, I'd love to help and support. And I live in San Francisco. <laughs> Great. We will definitely keep you in mind and I will get your contact information. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't think you need to repeat it. But she had a mic, right? Uh, honestly, the Bay Area OWASP group, just um, this group, you, like Matt said, um, packet hacking. You can you can definitely email or just post in the the Slack channel. Just ask, and people can drop probably nine different things in there. I will give a shameless plug that Secure Diversity is um, looking for volunteers to take on leadership roles, both with DOS and with the nonprofit. Um, and it's on our website, securediversity.org. I'm going to review applications starting in June. Um, so please come help us do some good work uh, and help plan this conference too. The other thing I would say is uh, you mentioned OWASP, and I think Prashant is around here somewhere. So he's really involved in OWASP Bay Area. So feel free to, to hit him up if he comes back in the room. 
Hi, y'all. Um, with no formal mentorship background, I'm wondering what the most appropriate and polite way to ask for a mentorship and what is the best kind of cadence to have with that person for it to be effective? In your experience. <laughs> I mean, this is, I can, I can answer just from personal experience on this one. And this may not be for everyone, but like shoot your shot and go on LinkedIn. I've had so many people just message me and I will respond um, unless you're a vendor. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> not, not all vendors, though. Um, but really I've done some informal mentorships that way. Um, and of course it's all, you know, people's time and generally like once a month is kind of the cadence I was sticking to, but I think it's different for everyone. Um, so I, I think that it, it may not, again, may not be for everyone, but if you hit me up on LinkedIn, I'll write you back. <laughs> there have been a couple of different scenarios for me. Um, two are pretty straightforward. Somebody will reach out and say, Hey, I have this specific problem and I need some help. And those are great, right? Like it's not the expectation of like there is an ongoing meeting. Somebody will say, hey, I have an offer and I don't know whether this is good or bad and I don't know how well to negotiate. Great. Like we've been through a couple of offers ourselves, like we can do that. The other one is more kind of open-ended and unstructured that I've entertained as well. Like, hey, I'm looking for a mentor these are the things that I see common between what I want to do and with your profile. So this person has done the research and then they've identified me as a mentor with possible connection. So I've said yes to one of those as well, where now we meet um, every couple of months. And then there are two other mentees I have who have been my direct reports in the past, and I'm really invested in their career. So with them, I meet once every six weeks. Um, so that's more of a natural, long-term like relationship. Um, there was there was one request that comes to mind that I I said yes to, but I didn't really feel like that was the right thing for me to say yes to or it just didn't work for the both of us was there was a person who, she was going through the interview process and she wanted somebody to coach her through the interview process I just didn't have the time and energy to kind of to be able to do that um, and I respectfully respectfully bowed out yeah one thing that I would strongly encourage you to to think about is to lead with your vulnerability. Vulnerability is a strength if it's used correctly. So like they were saying, just put it out on LinkedIn, honestly, and say, I'm trying to break into this. I'm looking for somebody to talk to you and kind of keep it at that. And People, the, the right people will respond. There really are people out there who are looking for that and want to help with that. I think you want to, there's a fine line between asking for help and complaining. Like you don't want to get on there and say, it's impossible to get into this. I can never do it. That sounds like a rant and very few people actually want to engage with a ranter. But if you show up as somebody who's eager to learn and asking for help, it's kind of a compulsive thing, I think, for a lot of good, high quality people that they will just want to help. Yeah, I mean, just for me, um, you see me on Slack. Um, I'm, I like to be as approachable as I can. Um, so to just kind of harken back to something that Lee said, um, those of you I've talked to today and those of you I've talked to in the past, I've made it very clear that I am not the best mentor for everybody. And it's, you know, it, it's, you know, if I work out and that's great. Otherwise I know three people right now who are also like, who can point, you know, what, oh, sorry. Yeah. They're can, who can point you to, uh, to somebody. So that definitely is a thing. Um, I would say just reach out. The other thing, just to kind of come back to something that was said previously about like doing, putting in the work. Um, I won't name her cause I didn't get a chance to, to ask her permission first. But my last mentee um, was she put in the work and she just got an opportunity, which she is head over heels about um, because she put in the work and um, it's worth 
I don't know if she's going to name herself or not, but if she does, congratulations to her. Hopefully she's watching. So. Thank you. I'm going to have a virtual question I'm going to read. Oh, to Tad specifically. Okay. Sorry, it's really, can you turn up the, okay. Tad, did you know that there would be a path to leveling up at the time of getting hired? Um, because they said, we've heard a lot. We've heard a lot the message of non-negotiables, but at the same time, I think your story gives a perspective of you may not get that non-negotiable at higher, but there could be a path to leveling up soon. I was willing to take anything that was out there. <laughs> Didn't matter. Um, and I think a lot of that tends to just be me believing in myself. And, you know, on the one hand, it was hard to break in as a 39-year-old with, you know, with a, with a kid and everything. But I also had a lot of professional accomplishment behind me where I just knew that I could go in and if I had an opportunity, I'm just going to fucking crush it. <laughs> like I just knew I would because I had a track record of doing that and everything else. I just needed the opportunity. So that's why. And, and when I came out of the boot camp, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just wanted a technical job of some kind I actually really liked the coding and I liked the databases and the just, I thought all that stuff was interesting. I knew about that much about all of it, but that was fine. I just kind of thought I'll go in and find my way and hopefully not be the, uh, I don't know, a react developer. And I never really liked front end stuff, but um, I just don't really care about UI as much as a lot of people I would say. Um, but um, once I got in and, and I was a support engineer, the guy that was, you know, in like the rubbing shoulders, the guy that sat behind me was the head of product. And he used to sit there and ask me, you know, kind of what I was up to. And at some point the CTO came over and was like, we've been looking for a security engineer. I think it needs to be you. And I was like, that's a terrible idea. Because I don't know any of those things that you have listed on the the on the job application. It's like honestly, I, you'll learn all that. It's the way that you think, and so um, I would say there wasn't a clear path in, but it was just more of my nego my non negotiable is I have to be able to support myself and my son, and everything else that kind of comes after that is fine. Yeah. I like to say that there's your need to have, nice to have, and then would love to have. And so you, you, you can't, if you can't live on X salary, then you can't, you shouldn't accept that salary. But like maybe like a certain benefits package is a nice to have. You'd really like it, but it's not going to make or break you. Other questions? All right. One more. Anyone in the chat? Okay. I love that we have virtual engagement. Someone's looking for Canadian opportunity. Uh, opportunity. Oh, uh, do folks know Canadian opportunities, like opportunities for involvement, like different orgs that are, that operate in Canada? There's is there besides Vancouver? So Pedro Duty had an office in Toronto. <laughs> um, there's a lot of the same organizations we have here are mirrored. Um, and it, it depends on where you are. Um, Canada is large. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but I think in the major cities, uh, you will find a lot of opportunities. Okay. Okay. There's a, one more. Um, Okay, probably maybe to Swati because I mentioned Forte. For mid slash senior mid career folks looking to get into executive leader positions, how do you recommend approaching the leveling up? What's the path to getting exposure to groups like Forte? This is a very broad question, so I'll, I'll try my best to answer. Um, so at least for me, from going to mid to kind of senior executive level position, there are certain prerequisites. And then the prerequisites are definitely higher mm -hmm. and in sort of a bigger list than, you know, sort of entry level. But I do see how entry level is getting really hard these days. So I recognize that. Um, so a couple of things that I had to personally overcome was, you know, 
going from managing individual contributors to managing managers is usually a big move. And then from going to managers to managing managers, so sort of two level deep, like how are you going to lead an organization? So that was one big shift for me personally. The other one was how do you prove your prove yourself and to others that you can do both strategy and operations. So I've been, I was in the world of defense operations for a long time, but then I also had to prove that, hey, I can move sort of the strategic direction of the security team. So that was another thing. There are, of course, two other things. One is obviously like communication and executive communication to be able to communicate to various audiences. Um, then, of course, stakeholder, um, you know, management and team building. So you have to be able to, you should be a really good hiring manager. Like you can't build a team without hiring. So those were kind of four or five different things that I had to work on to get to the executive level. Um, to groups like, you know, Forte or there are many other, like I think Chief um, is another one. So there are there are many more. It really depends on sort of the mission of the organization, right? Like each organization have their mission. And usually there is like a nomination process or an application process for each of these organizations. Um, and Forte has one too. Thank you. Um, is there anything as the panel that one of us hasn't asked you that you would think is really impactful to giving back and being involved in the community? I know that's super broad. Yeah, I think I will say that it is a time commitment, right? Like that's something that you need to think about, um, think about really for yourself and see where you want to put your time into. Um, I've also had, you know, there are also other opportunities, right? Like there are opportunities to go advise a startup. There are opportunities to go be on the board and all those are paid opportunities. So you have to also make a financial decision of like, yeah, if you want to work for nonprofits, most of that is a non-paid opportunity. So it should really, it should be the driving force. Otherwise there are enough, you know, glittery opportunities out there if, if you know, if that's what you want to do. So I think it comes down to, um, you know, time, energy, and focus and how you want to spend that. And if it fills your bucket, if it fills your bucket, do it. All right. I do want to add that um, there isn't a third co-founder who I've actually, I haven't met because she um, stepped away from Day of Security a while ago. Her name's Laura. And then um, we also have two more advisory board members, Jessica, who is in um, Florida, and she has been rocking it as a badass on Hopin for us. Amazing. Today. Jessica, thank you. We miss you. <laughs> um, so she is holding down the fort for us. Um and has, was my right hand all day yesterday. So super appreciate her. Bum, she couldn't be here, but we understand. And then you met the other advisory board member this morning, Brianne. She spoke in the room back there, um, but she had to head out of town. So she couldn't join us this afternoon because she's presenting at B-Side Seattle tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> oh, she's been with us from the beginning. She's one of the, uh, the stories that Matt likes to tell of one of the original women that was in the boot camp. I guess I can let Matt tell it since he's here. Yeah, I, I, I love telling the story because it's just, it's it's so Brienne, if you know Brienne. Um, when we first did uh, Day of Security, before it was called Day of Security, it was called the Security Bootcamp. And it was a combination of Lookout and Hacker One. And so we had a room, it was one single room, it was 25 women, and all of the instructors, every single one would come out and go, dude, this girl in the back with this blue hair is killing it. Like everything we throw out there, she's just knocking it out of the park like you cannot give her something that she can't handle and um i had not met brianne she um, was a boot camp grad yeah. too like no job no just boot camp grad back when that was a super stigma yeah she and so i walk in this room and i've never met brianne before and i see her in the back of the room and i, I just say you know i've been I've been warned about you, like, and sure enough, like there was nothing you could throw at her that she could not knock out of the park. And so I, I think uh, folks who know Brienne and look back at her career thus far, it, I mean, it, it's been the same thing. It's been this, this rocket uh, and that's just who she is. So um, thank you, Brienne, if you're watching. Um, yeah, we're super proud. So. 
So thank you. Thank you to our panel for coming up and sharing about your experiences and joining us today.